All right, so thanks everyone for um, attending tonight's user group session. If you're not in touch with us on these various social media platforms, please do keep an eye out. We are um, catching up on the video uploads into the YouTube channel. So big thanks to Bill Gunning for assisting with that. Um, so in terms of the organizers of this group, my name is Dimitri. I'm a partner at Turn Digital. We're also here with Mike Dixon, who is a senior consultant with Wellington Street Consulting. And we have Bill Gunning, who is a technical lead. Um, so if you have any complaints or uh, negative feedback for this user group, direct them to Mike. If you have anything positive, um, you can send them my way. What did I do? So, um, so let's talk about the previous session. Um, Bill had a great presentation last month on the unintended consequences of sharing from SharePoint sites. Um, we are working through our backlog of the YouTube videos, so it's not up there just yet, but it will be fairly soon. So definitely keep an eye on our channel for those updates. And that being said, let's dive into the Office 365 updates since last time. <clears throat> There's been a few hundred updates. We can't cover them all and keep this reasonable. So we've cherry picked a few that we think will you'll find interesting. So the first thing is gonna be around Teams. So today, if you hold a Teams live event, you pretty much need to define who the presenter roles will be in advance. And anybody that's not a presenter is an attendee and they don't have the ability to be promoted in real time. With this new feature of allowing external and anonymous presenters, you could actually um, share that link with additional people, even while the, the session is happening so that they could join in and act as a presenter. So <clears throat> very cool breaking down some of those walls that we have um, when we do host live events. Next up is a planner update. So previously we were tied to about eight or so different tags slash colors in planner when tagging content. This has now been expanded up to 25, which gives us the ability to have even more definition around the different types of tags that we have associated to our tasks. And of course, with the screen, if you click the pencil button, you rename it just like you would rename the previous colors and whatever label you give it will stick for that entire plan. Moving forward, there's a new video only meeting stage experience. So today we have what we see at the top where if you have nine people in a meeting and some do not have their cameras on, this will primarily still show you boxes just with people's avatars or letters if they don't have an avatar uploaded. Um, with this new feature, it'll actually um, remove the boxes from people that are not interactive to give you a little bit more of an interactive look and feel. And I've actually noticed this <clears throat> happening with my environment this week, uh, but this is essentially being rolled out and should be available to you very soon um, if you don't have it yet. Next up, um, there's some additional views coming to Teams um, where sometimes when people are presenting or multiple people are chatting, um, today things are done in a very grid-like manner. And sometimes you don't have the ability to have a nice sized picture of the presenter if they're sharing something full screen. Or sometimes there's different dynamic ways that might make things easier where you can mix and match the different sizes of the boxes. Um, so this new feature is starting to roll out just about now, and this will be available towards the end of this month. Next up, so for my SharePoint internet users on Modern, um, there are some new analytics features that are coming out into the SharePoint page analytics, including the ability to see trend lines for um, how this week's or months or years um, content compares to the prior ones. Um, so this should hopefully give you a little bit more insights as how your internet is being leveraged. So a reminder, Microsoft is ending all support for IE 11 after August 17th, which believe it or not is only a few months away. Um, this doesn't mean that they will prevent you from using IE 11. It just means they will not ensure that it works properly. So if you're still on IE 11, please, please make a change over to a more modern browser. And as just one bullet point, <clears throat> IE 11 for Teams um, support ended last year. So hopefully you're not trying to use Teams in IE 11. I have tried it, it's not pretty. Um, please come over to a more modern browser. The next update is on OneDrive. <clears throat> so we've all been there where we've had a customer or a user call us because they didn't realize deleting things out of their OneDrive on their desktop would actually also delete it from the, their OneDrive in the cloud or the SharePoint sites that they've synced locally for everybody else. 
This new feature is for the OneDrive client. And the first time you go to delete something, you get this notification that really explains that when you delete something, it's no longer available across any of your devices, nor on the web. So this could be a good reminder where somebody might accidentally click something, not realizing it's not actually you know, impacting others. And you know, I've had this happen dozens of times in the last couple of years. I'm sure many people on this call could relate. Moving forward, OneDrive for Business is also increasing the maximum file size. Today, it was 100 gigs per file. And actually, as of uh, this week, they've increased that to be 250 gigs per file. So now you could take all of your um, town hall broadcasts that are in 4K, 50 channels, and store them in one container. I bet you that's in preparation of the move from stream to OneDrive for Teams recording, meeting recordings. Yeah, that very well could be. So um, next reminder, um, so Skype for Business Online retires in a few short months. Um, Skype for Business has been uh, kind of branched off into two different branches, one being the online version part of O365 and one being the on-prem version of Skype for Business Server. So this is, does not impact the Skype for Business Server that you have on-prem. So if you have very robust implementations, this will not break. But if you're using Skype for Business Online, then Microsoft is basically turning the service off. By this point, you would have received multiple notices and migration paths to get from Skype for Business onto Teams. If you haven't done so, you might want to make this a priority so that you don't lose your um, Skype for Business type functionality. As a reminder, this does not impact Skype for consumer. Um, so that, that's a completely separate product altogether. Good Next. question about that, Dimitri. I'm trying to read if it's here in the notes. Do you know what, what if any effect this has on the uh, communications gateway server for the on-prem side? Um, so I believe that gateway can be configured to work with Microsoft Teams. And because it's on-prem part, I believe it's actually um, an add-on onto Skype for Business Server for on-prem. OK. That's gotcha. my understanding. I, I could be wrong on this one. So the next up, so we've all been in companies where um, there's value in tagging which emails are coming in from external users. And if you ever had to implement this, you realize that there really wasn't a lot of good options. The best option to date is to use a transport rule to inject some HTML into the subject line or into the top of the body of the email that just says, you know, warning external. So it's it's not a pretty solution because it, it really kind of destroys the um, the original message as it was sent across. And it also gets confusing because if somebody forwards that to an internal resource, then it shows that it's external. It's not it's not the best way of doing it. So Microsoft's rolling out a new feature where you can enable an additional um, Outlook block to show up to indicate that something came over from an external user. This way, you're not making any changes to the actual email as it was received. But at the same time, you're able to show this um, to your users so they understand it is coming externally. Um, this is currently available for um, the iPhone, the Android, and Outlook web access. And we're hoping that this will soon be available for the Outlook client for PC and Mac as well. All right, so thanks to the company I work for, Turn Digital, for sponsoring the event. They're helping keep our lights on. And with that being said, um, not to delay any further, we'd like to hand the stage over to Mike Dixon, who, that has a great presentation for us regarding metadata is not dead. Mike, over to you. All right, thank you very much, Dimitri. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. 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 Awesome. All right. So my name is Mike Dixon. I am a senior consultant for Wellington Street Consulting that recently just celebrated 15 years. So we've been doing this 15 years. I myself have been in the business for over 20 years um, and have done tons of work. Nobody really cares. Uh, Wellington Street Consulting are basically a group of Office 365 consultants. We focus on digital culture, process automation. I don't know 
why my deck seems to have a mind of its own. That is not a process that I automated. Um, and cloud education. <laughs> um, so for today's agenda, we're going to be talking about the various forms of metadata in Microsoft 365. We're going to be talking about the content types and content type hub. We're going to be talking about keywords, as in enterprise keywords, and also the, the benefits of the reusability and distribution. Um, just so you guys know, I'm not, I'm not a big uh, presentation or PowerPoint guy. So there's going to be very little on the slides here. It's going to be a lot, uh, rather just a lot of demos and uh, just open Q&A with you guys, because I know that there's going to be tons of questions. So the slides are really light here, but I did put a couple of things down just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. So with that said, I'm actually going to jump over real quick. And if you guys can all check the chat pane of Teams. Just posted a poll want to get an idea of where people are at and what they have utilized. All right. And by the way, please feel free to uh, take yourself off of mute if you have any questions or raise your hand. Um, I may or may not notice the raised hand, so. Mike, are you asking like, Recently or ever? Ever. Okay. I'm going with ever. Okay. Because I'm really curious to see what out here people haven't ever used or or what out here people have never even heard of. Because that's that that's what I'm really interested in. But the my goal here is just to kind of expose people to all the different types of metadata and options and kind of some of the pros and cons and you know i mean th there's there's so much that can be done with it it's really wild so all right okay so results All right, so it looks like we have 21% of people have used custom columns. That's not surprising that that's the most. 21% have used content types. That's good to know. 20% on the term store. Very good. 15% on document sets. That's honestly higher than I expected. Um, and 11% on the content type hub and 11% on enterprise keywords. Okay, so yeah, enterprise keywords is an interesting use case because enterprise keywords are kind of what, what I would consider the, the starting point for metadata. It's a good way to really just kind of get started. But let's get into what metadata is. Um, any column in a list or library is a form of metadata. Anything listed in the term store is metadata, enterprise keywords, um, and even titles of documents or news posts, so names of things. Um, you know, one of the things to consider is also how um, I'm sorry, yeah, so na names of all of the folders that a document is in are 
kind of metadata. Now, these are the names of the folders. The reason that there's a big asterisk there is this is metadata in the specific generic term of data used to describe data, which is the technical definition of what metadata is. Data is information about data, so information about a document. The title, the author, the um, who modified it, when it was last modified, um, who first created it, and when it was last created. Um, those are the five metadata that we get right out of the box, right? We get title, who modified it, who created it, when it was modified, when it was created. Um, those are the five that we get out of the box. So, but outside of that, um, we actually talk about this on the next slide. So, how to metadata. So, in order to determine what should be used as metadata, you know, this is one of the biggest challenges that a lot of people have is, is where do I start? You know, because it's so vast, it can be anything, but should it be anything? Um, so, a couple of guidelines that I have written out here for determining this. And also what I highly recommend is that you get together with your team and it should be a very small team. I'm a really, really big fan of Susan Hanley's definition of a team is um, a, a group small enough that you can feed them with two large pizzas. If you can't feed them with two large pizzas, it's too many people. Okay, so Get your get your two pizzas of people in a room with what you know once it's safe to do so but until then in a team's meeting and have a brainstorming session and in that brainstorming session you can kind of ask these questions you know how do you tell this file apart from the other files that are in that same sort of area um what would you name the folders when if you were to put this in a traditional folder infrastructure and then also what would you name the file i think it's really important that na file naming conventions should always be kind of a part of any of the metadata brainstorming sessions um, because the the naming conventions are basically the last piece of metadata that goes in there you know um, and sometimes it's important to, <laughs> I've seen some people go way too far with metadata and it's like, okay, that, that can just be in the file name. You know, we don't need a column for that particular piece. Um, so it all depends on what you're using. All right, so the next question, why to metadata? So biggest reasons, for why to metadata, searchability. Um, searchability is really the big one. Um, by using metadata, we can, we can create all kinds of super simple things to easily and quickly locate files. Um, and we can build on top of the fact that Microsoft prioritizes any, any search terms that you put in the search if it's listed as metadata. Um, it also facilitates automation. So for any of my uh, fellow uh, power addicts, power platform people out there who are a big fan of uh, flows and power automate, uh, keywords are a great thing to use as either uh, a trigger or a, uh, a condition for your flows. It's a great way to guarantee consistent behaviors from your flows. Um, the other really huge thing about using metadata over like a really deep folder structure is we can, we can then change a whole bunch of information about it, about the document 
without ever actually moving it. So when people create links to the files, those links will never break because the file doesn't actually change. It's just the library and the file name. The metadata associated to the file can change. So you could be like, oh, this went from an idea to a first draft to a, you know, to a first read to now it's actually published. But that document can go through all of that evolution and still be in one location. And people can use one link to access it throughout its entire life cycle. Uh, so I think that's a huge part of it. And as for when to metadata, I mean, always, pretty much always, you know, folders bad. Yeah, you know, Mike, I used to agree with you on the folders bad, but I think Microsoft has given up and, and we're using folders all over the place. Look at Teams. All the channels are folders in the documents library and a share yeah. SharePoint site. Yeah. And you will notice as a matter of practice, um, I actually don't use any of those. Um, and I recommend to my clients that they don't use any of those. So uh, the channels are important when you're working in a team because those are your work streams within a team. They're, they're key. Yep. Channels are good, sure. But you don't have to use the you don't have to use those folders as your file stores. Yeah. But you try to get, and then you can't remove the files tab from the team. And to get somebody to ignore Nor that one, you can't to. even move it. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I, I've had end user issues with that when I try to do a different document library. And yeah. I've just given up on I'm using the folders. And then occasionally I'll make them a view. If I can get them to do a little metadata, that's great. And I'll make a view outside of the folders. Okay. So let's. I'll actually just show you a real quick fix to that. Because we do that all the time. So if you look right here, here's the uh, here's the files tab. Here's our files app for our marketing site. And we have links to document libraries that live in other locations or even within this same site. This is all right in your files app. I like that idea, it's a good idea, nice. And you can do this, you can do this without having any files locally. And on, in a lot of our teams, we don't. Yeah, but you're not using multiple channels though. You're still using just the general channel. The key about using different channels is it gives me different work streams. I have different chats, yeah. I can do planners, right. all Which of that means kind of I stuff. I can have I different boards. links to different libraries throughout each of these channels. Yeah. So whatever whatever library is relevant to that particular channel, you're we can have a, a separate a set of links folders. just for that. So we don't have anything in advertising. We don't use. So you much. would make an advertising library and put that in as your quote unquote folder. Yeah. yeah, like so, for example, for our web content that links directly to our Blogginator. And Blogginator was one of the demos I was going to do today because we have tons of metadata in our Blogginator. And so, you would open it up and showing you that metadata for that that library rather than the uh, documents library. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, because if you and you get back by just clicking the, the breadcrumb. Mm-hmm. Cool. Nice trick. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. Glad I could help. Um, and actually, thank you for the segue because this is actually one of the key things that um we were going to. I was going to demonstrate. So uh, we decided that for our marketing here at Wellington Street, um, we needed a good way to manage all of the different ideas that we were coming up with for things to blog about. And we also have like 
LinkedIn articles that we were writing and web pages that needed to be updated. So we wanted a place where we could put all of that and also track it so that we could see what its status was. So we have a quick dashboard here where we can just see what the copy status is. So if I expand on the drafts and I didn't expand it, I clicked on it, but that works too. So as you can see here, these are all of the items that are currently in a draft state. And if you look here, we also have different types of content. So this one's a web page, and then we have two in here that are actually blog posts. All right, and if I go over here, we even have direct access to all of our views, so we can see things by author, by series, and my favorite is just by recent. There's nothing fancy here. It's just literally sorted by the last date modified. So you could just hop in here. Oh, hey, look, we need to do a blog post for metadata is not dead because we do a post for all of the uh, presentations that we do. OK, so one of the other things that we've done with this is we've actually created content types for each of these different types of materials that we have in here. And if I were to open one of these, I don't know that this, it does. Awesome, perfect. So if I open a blog post, now this is, believe it or not, a blank document. This is our blog post template. OK, and one of the things I wanted to talk about today, one of the key things that we can do is there are tons and tons of things that we can do to kind of trick people into accidentally filling out metadata. You know, so for example, if I go up here and I type in this title field, you know, boss three, six, five, metadata demo. Sometimes we spell things right, although it's me, so not usually. Now, if you'll notice, as soon as I filled that out, that also populated right here. Um, if this were a part of a series, we actually have a lookup list that looks to our series, which apparently is not working. Um, we also have keywords that can be assigned to it. So this would be uh, SharePoint. For the most part. And I can even change the content type. If I filled this out by mistake, I can change that back. I can also here change the status to any of the statuses that we saw here. Now, I want to make it really clear, this is just Microsoft Word. So we haven't really done anything fancy here. The only thing that's happening here is this is uh, just Microsoft Word for a document that is now hosted in SharePoint. Uh, so if I go up here, let me move to that, and I save this document, we go. Marketing, Loginator. And save. Boom. And then that's that. And now once that's saved, you could also, there's also a properties pane that you can open up. That is available over here. And that will also show metadata that is available. Um, and then we can just go through and fill out all of the information. 
about that. So let's get into how we would actually do this. Okay, so there's a couple of components here. So the first thing is, if we go to our bloginator, which looks like this on the SharePoint side, remarkably similar, and we go to those library settings, you'll see here that we've enabled content type, content types here, and we just added these content types from the store. So we did that just by clicking on add from existing site content types. And when I drop down this group, we actually have a defined group just for Bloginator. Oh, cool. We added neat. And I created these new content types so I can add to that. That's awesome. I, I swear I didn't mean to do that. I legit forgot that I needed to do this. This is perfect. You know, a, a trick I was taught a long, long time ago, if you're making your own content types, put them in a group and name that group. Start it with dot, 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 so that that custom yeah. group goes to the very top of all of your searches for the content types. Makes it much faster to find them. Yeah, that's what I did. That oh, right there. I can't see my screen, sorry. <laughs> yep. You are correct, and that is exactly what I did. See, proved your point, and I didn't realize it, sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. Yeah, um, I don't do that with the actual content types. I use the group names because we have so many content types that we use. Oh, agreed, group name only. So we, we only put the periods in the group names. And that way, the groups are relatively small. So, oh, like Instagram and resumes, all kinds of fun stuff. Okay. So, here's a perfect example, right? I just added white paper and newsletter. To this, so we have we now have two new content types. All right, and if I jump back here to Bloginator, right away you will see those are now listed here. But there's going to be one difference. If I click on these, when this comes up, wah, wah, it's just a blank Word document. No fun at all. So what are we to do? So in a separate document library, and this is how I highly recommend you guys do this. What we have is a hidden document library, so I don't have this published on our links list, but we have a, a hidden library called marketing templates. The reason I like to do this as a separate document library is specifically so that we can change the properties on this library. Uh, I'm sorry, the permissions on this. You don't want everyone to be able to access your templates. If you everyone can access your templates, your templates don't stay templates, right? How many times have you guys gone into the, you know, blank, you know, the document that's labeled as blank direct deposit form and cl double clicked on it and it's like, oh, cool, there's a picture of somebody's check in here. That's awesome. <laughs> because somebody wrote their actual information over the one titled blank. So the best fix for that is to actually create a separate library and then just give that library separate permissions so that it's essentially just read only for most of the world and only only the people that you want to be able to actually edit those can edit them so i actually don't remember where we were with this because it was back in october um 
So we have a newsletter doc in here and we have a white paper doc. All right, so these documents already exist. Let's see if I actually modified them or if they're just copies of one of the others. Ooh, that does look modified slightly. No, something about WordPress. Okay, so I started to modify it. All right, we'll run with it. That's fine. Um, all right, so that's the newsletter. I'm going to go here. Where am I going to go? I'm going to go here. And one of the nice little hidden gems that I have recently found in here is if you go to the info path, the info pane of a document, and you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's now a path with a little link here. Boom. That just copied the path to this document directly to my clipboard when I clicked on this little icon. This is one of my favorite little hidden gems in SharePoint because that used to be a nightmare to get to. So now if I go over to Bloginator and I go into my library settings here, And I click on newsletter. And then we click on advanced. We have the ability to update a template. Oh no, no, we don't want to do that. We already got it. We're just going to paste it in there. You can paste in the full URL and it will just trim it down. Sometimes it'll trim it down. Content type newsletter. Oh, is read only. Mm. All right. So, no. <laughs> there we go. Fixed. Try that again. Hey, now we got it. So now this content type is now associated with that Word document that's in the other library. So what that should do now is when I go to Bloginator now and I select new and newsletter, it should now come up with the purple one. Yay. So now I have the purple one. Now, this isn't completely finished, so let's go finish that. And then we will have it really clean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Boom. Marketing templates. And I'm just going to highlight this and I actually need to change the content type of that to something that's not listed in here. Right, because I didn't add the same things to ha. Huh. So here's another great point. You need to add the same content types to both libraries. So I added them to our destination, but not to this one. So add existing. This is good because you guys get to see it again. Go here and double click and double click. And click on OK. All right, so now those content types also exist in my library over here. Newsletter, white paper. Good. So now I can highlight my newsletter. And I can assign it the content type of newsletter. 
and I can set its def make sure that its default copy status is idea. And then we're good to go. So using the same, so Mike the Bill, you're using the same content type on both libraries. Um, yep. On this library, when you do new document, it also shows up because it's coming from the content type, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're just assigning it to keep things clean over here to that right. metadata. Yeah. But that's probably not necessary, but it's nice to have. It's nice from this point of view. But I'll bet if you do a new uh, new newsletter here, it'll show you a blank document, not the newsletter. That is correct. Very good. Very good. Yes, you are absolutely correct because that setting is separate. But right. honestly, I don't care because that's not the purpose of this library. The purpose of this library is only to have one of each type and modify from there. So this is, think of this, this, this library is our master list, okay? So only like our marketing executives or the design team, those would be the only people who have access to edit this, okay? They're not creating the actual content or copy. So then this site has to be open to everybody on the tenant or anybody in the audience that needs to consume it. Uh, read only, yes. Read only, yeah. Yeah, yep. And, and that's why, and that's why you'll notice every time I'm going to it, I have to click on the site contents to get to it, because I don't have it listed directly in the right. navigation. And this alternatively, you site. could audience that that list. This way, you could have it conveniently on the navigation for you, but then the rest of your people can't see it. That is correct. Um, this is. We've had this Loginator for a very, very long time. And um, yeah, I mean, 2018 was our first, uh, well, that's, e that's even date modified. So who knows? Um, and hey, Mike. Um, but yeah, audience targeting was not originally available for this. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. It sounded like Christine. Yes, yes, it's, it's me. Hey, quick question Christine? on your... Okay, yeah, you can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. Um, on your templates, because obviously you just use just like the, sta the standard Word files. Yes. Um, ha did you ever use the actual template files, the .x, and would that actually make a difference? It does make a difference in that um, they never seem to work properly. <laughs> um, I'm not, I honest to God, I don't know why, but I have tried using those and they just don't work for some reason. And it could be that I'm doing something wrong. Um, I am not a word guru by any stretch. Um, my area of expertise is literally just the integration components of Word into um, SharePoint mm -hmm. and how that interoperability can work and the fun things that we can do with that. But that that's pretty much it. Hmm. Okay. Oh, okay. Now you got me thinking. Because normally I also would also use a docs for the very reason that you mentioned because the templates, <laughs> word templates can be kind of funky, but yeah. now it's like, hmm, that could be yeah. a side project. I, I definitely tried that. I tried that years and years ago. So maybe whatever I ran into has changed because, you know, 200 updates every month. So who knows? Um, and uh, I, I honestly, I have not tried to use the template format in quite a while, but, um, yeah, the last time I did try to use it, it just threw tons and tons of errors. And yet, if I do it this way, it works beautifully. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I always use DocX. I've never, I stopped using template years ago because like Christine said, it's it's just wanky. Yeah. I, I don't think it actually does what it was intended to do. 
And I, I think it did up even, to about Word 2003, and then even even my dog disagrees. So. Um, any other it's questions like on any of this? around 2007. Anybody else have any questions? There was there was kind of a lot there. Is this so, all old hat? Yeah, in, this approach, in this approach, you're architecting everything. We put end users, they can just do real quick, they can add a document, you know, as a template right on the on the document library. Yep. Yeah, and you know, you can do you can do really simple documents too, like letterheads. You know, um, this library, by the way, this marketing templates library is the housing for templates for all of marketing, not just the bloginator. So that's why we have other things in here. Like there's one that's just called document and there's one that's, uh, you know, called letterhead with a tiered nav. Oh yeah, that looks like it's a contract. <laughs> um, so, any other questions? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? All right, cool. Um, oh, so the one thing that I didn't touch on that I'm sure somebody will ask is how we insert that stuff. So if I go here, I cheated and I pinned this up here because I always lose it, um, but it's under insert and quick parts. So if you go to insert and then quick parts, there's a sub menu there called document property and within that document property you will see any of the columns that you have added in your SharePoint library so we won't see in that one because it hasn't been saved but I for example open this guy OK, so if I click in this outline field. And again, we go to so insert. And then quick parts and then document property. And you see in this one, we now have my. Copy media type, copy status. Uh, publish date series status. that everything? Yeah, copy media type goes there. Series, keywords. Yep, whole nine yards. So that's that. So if I go there, and even in the header and footer, I can then adjust this. Now, <laughs> here's what's interesting. I do not have these values added to this particular column type. So I actually need to dig down this column and add uh, newsletter and white paper to, oh, well, I do have white paper, but that's not what this is, is it? Nope, it's not. Okay, so let's not do that. Oh, I can't undo that. There we go. Um, so yeah. That's that. I will give you this little tip though too. Um, this stuff can be really, really hard to style. So if you want like inline styling, my recommendation is to actually um, just write out your text. Um, my copy will go here. Status 
of this is. And then I just type in the word status. And just keep on going. Um, and then what, what's cool about this is when you're when you're teaching your your people how to do this, you can just tell them, OK, just just write out the stuff and then I'll I'll go in and I'll show you how to how to update it. OK, so. Changed. OK, so what I like to do. Because once you have this in here. You need to be really fickle around around it in order to kind of format stuff around it. So what I find is easier is to actually take a line like this, apply your formatting to that. Like so. And then just highlight. You can highlight the word that you want to replace and then use that. And just click on status. Boom. OK, so now that status is going to be whatever the status is. Oh, and that's a different status because I want the copy status, but that's fine. Does that make sense? So I do have a question, a quick one. Yeah. It seems to me that you're working with a word on the desktop connected yep. directly to the the cloud based version of this document, right? That's true. So, so yeah. if if we had synchronized this document to the desktop, yep. Would these things work the same way working with the synchronized copy? Would I still have all of this metadata or would it disappear? You would still have all of the metadata. So, okay, so the the columns sync, the columns and the column data will sync with it. However, if somebody is so so say you're in offline mode and then somebody adds or updates a uh, an attribute that to say you know somebody somebody adds a new value to one of those drop downs, you will will not see that until you reconnect and it syncs up again. Makes sense. OK, so Thank if you. I go to if I go to this info pane here. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> of course, so the demo gods are, are making fun of me now. Let's try clicking on it anyways and see. If we can get it. And we do not. Oh, we do. OK. I mean, you're working on a template directly. It's easier once you start authoring documents. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so for your end users, it really shouldn't be that big of a deal. Um, Microsoft has also announced that uh, they are they are working on a thing that will allow you to display and view metadata in File Explorer for those synchronized libraries. Oh, you just made me so happy with that, Mike. I know. I can't because wait. Because you can never get your end users, especially the ones that love their folders, they, they yep. just don't understand why metadata is so important because they can't use it because they love their folders. And you that's what I, that's exactly what I was driving at. That yeah. that's 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 right. a huge deal. Awesome. You guys so are awesome at segues here. This is perfect. OK, so I mean, let's the, start the talking same, about maybe it. later. Yeah. The sync client supports it, but I don't think the rest of Windows 10 right now supports it, right, Mike? If you move it out of that OneDrive folder and move that file around. Well, who knows? I mean, nobody knows because they haven't released any of it yet. Right. Um, way back in the day, for a blip in time, there was a product called the SharePoint Workspace. And the SharePoint Workspace was exactly that. It was It was intended to be this kind of file explorer sort of application that would provide SharePoint like views in that it could display um, custom columns and metadata within it. Um, it was 
it was a great idea. Um, they had lots and lots of problems with the execution of it to the point where they eventually just discontinued it entirely. Yeah. Um, and that made me a very sad panda. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, as you can see, I'm a big fan of synchronizing libraries. I have a lot of them, uh, including the Blogginator. So if I look here at my Blogginator, yeah, everything's pretty flat right now. And uh, if I go up here and I right click on my columns, I don't have any super cool interesting columns i mean there's a lot of columns in here but uh, they have nothing to do with sharepoint so i come back here on occasion and check to see if anything's magically going to happen but nothing so far <laughs> so so thank you for addressing that. That's great. I'll be happy to yeah. see it when it finally does make it because that will hey, make the transition. Believe you me, I will be the one screaming to the moon about it when it happens. So yeah, yeah. stay tuned well, to our YouTube. I will. I will definitely be bringing it up. I can't wait. It's going to be epic. But awesome. to be able to, to be able to use File Explorer right here and just imagine this with like a little drop down viewer, just like you have in SharePoint document libraries. Oh, awesome. That would be very awesome. exciting. Thank you. But again, my and that's not even so. So full disclosure, that's my hopes and dreams and aspirations for what I want it to be. Uh, Microsoft has not committed to any of that. They've just said we're working. We know that this is a problem. We're working on it. We hope to have something soon. So. So, you know, sometime soon. Um, so here's another thing that I wanted to bring up is if you have a ton of copy, like all over the place. Okay, so think of things like contracts. Think of any of the documents that you've ever had to go through and you do a search and replace. You know, how do we update our contract? Well, you take the most recent contract, you do a save as, then you do a search and replace on the old company name when you insert the new company name, and then you hope and pray that all the apostrophes and pluralizations are correct. Um, this is a perfect solution for that exact scenario. Um, and we actually we actually do this, this same sort of thing is done with our contracts here at Wellington Street. So when we get a new client, we have a blank contract. We just type in the client's name and instead of instead of it saying client and third party throughout the contract, it actually says the name of the company, which honest to God makes contracts incredibly better to read. It's so much easier then when you're going through and you're trying to decipher all this legalese and then you're like, wait, which one's the third party at this point, you know? Um, and which one is agent, you know? You can just put it at the top and then just have it trickle all the way through. And not only is it doing a perfect um, uh, replace, find and replace, but it's also adding that as the metadata. And if you think about it, in all of the documents where you're doing that sort of stuff, the thing that you're swapping in and out is probably the key thing that you use, right? If we go back to my to my rules of how to determine metadata, one of the key ones is, um, you know, how does this document distinguish from those around it? You know, so, Think of these as like, you know, um, for all the developers out there, think of these as variables. They're just variables for your documents. So you're literally just inserting a variable. So you no longer have to decipher agent, client, vendor, all of that. You don't have to figure out which one's vendor, which one's agent, you know? You can just specify it in the very top paragraph you know, for your legal documents, you should be defining that sort of stuff. And then 
in there, you just populate it once and it trickles all the way through the document. And then in the library, you have it as metadata. You can sort by it, you can filter it. You know, you can al also add things like the date that it was executed. Um, maybe, maybe the date that it expires, if it has term limits. Anything else that you use in those documents that are variables, like maybe you have different terms of some sort. You know, this one's a net 15, this one's a net 30. Um, you know, maybe there's different billable hour rates or different products or who knows. But those things can all become the metadata and you can embed it directly into the Word document. And life is good. Does that make sense? All right, let's talk about folders. All right, so if we go back to our trusty bloginator, um, I'm a huge fan of the group by field. Okay, um, so we can do a group by and what I do is I just I just tell people that these are folders. They're they're virtual folders, I like to call it. I use group by to create virtual folders. So this is by status. Um, and hey, if Mike, I go, yeah. I had a question. Somebody was asking how you upload your templates. Um, so I know you're doing a shared document library, but you had how a question I, on the blog. On the... How I upload my documents. Oh, your template, I'm sorry. I think you're talking about the difference between using a content type versus just using the document's content yeah, type. So when I when I take uh, when I take the uh, um, I'm not really sure that I understand the question um, because you, you, I assume you're talking about how you would just get started. I mean, so Mike, you, so back in the you day. can get started with any existing document and kind of backpedal from an existing document and start kind of scraping things out. That's usually the easiest way to do it. So you could just take one of those documents and copy it in. You can either upload it. It doesn't really matter what your starting point is for your templates, templates library. So you can just you can just upload it using the upload button. You can drag and drop in here, or um, before you hit this, um, you can even just do a new regular document. If I do I, new menu. Yeah, but, I could, uh, Mike, I could I, if I wanted to turn that on. Mike, this is crazy. I'm not sure, Russell. Correct me if I'm wrong. If I if I'm in, interrupting, uh, not inter um, interpreting your question correctly. But like, I think Russell might be asking how to associate the template with the content type. Oh, OK. I think. I'm, I think I'm sorry, I, I, joined, I joined late. Yes, that's exactly it. And I didn't know if you were oh. using that new thing on the new menu to add a template or if you were doing it the old way. No. I, I joined late. No. OK, so the way that we do that, I can I can go over that. Sure. That's. OK, let's see if I go. Let me go back and I'll grab which one did I do before I did the newsletter. So I need the white paper, right? So say I want to use this document. As a template for a content type, OK, so I want to use this document that is called white paper. I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to click this button. This gives me a copy to the path. That copies the path to my clipboard. And then I'm going to go up here to the bloginator. This is the part that my users can see. OK, so everybody can see this. The part that I was just in, only a select few people can see that. This is the everybody side. I go to the everybody side. I go to my, my client settings. And then in the white paper, so I've turned on the content types. You guys all know how to do that, right? So you just go to advanced settings and then allow management of content types. You need to set this to yes. 
as soon as you do any of this. And then you just go down here and click on OK. And all that does is that actually lights up this whole area. Um, if you don't have that set to yes, this whole section titled content types isn't even visible. So the first section that you'll see is the columns listing. OK, so I go. So once I do that, I can then go into the white paper and under advanced settings. In the white paper. It gives me an option. It by default goes to template dot. DOTX. And I can just paste. Right over that. And this one is not set to read only, so I shouldn't get that same error message. Boom, we're good to go. And now that's it. So now in this document library. Anytime I hit this white paper button, it's going to come up with the document that is in the other document, the templates library as its default document. Now, I didn't even look at that document, so I have no idea what it's going to look like. But OK, it looks exactly the same as the other one, so it needs to be customized. So on the new menu, when you just click click the new menu there, and there's a, there's an option to add a template. Can you know if that can be associated with a content type? I'm not real sure how that new methodology works. Um, I believe it can be, um, but I'm not. I'm not positive. I'd have to get back to you on that. All right, thanks. And this process works with any Office document, not just Word, right? Nope. Only Word. Only Word. Only Word. I'm very sorry to say but it's only Word. But you can also do, without content types, you can do a PowerPoint and other templates if you upload it at the document library. Yeah, uh -oh. yeah, so you can have, okay, right, I'm sorry. You can associate any content type with any other template type. I'm sorry, let me back up. The only thing that you can only do in Word is the inserting of the metadata directly into the content of the into the body of the document? Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, Word is the only one that it, that allows for you know this title field and for this status thing to be a drop down. This is only supported in Word, but as far as doing the content types and the drop downs, yes, we can do all of that. We can list Excel documents and PowerPoints in here and assign content types and metadata to that. We just can't display the metadata within the body and have that directly connected, unfortunately. Um, OK, so before we were distracted by that, we were going to go into looking at faking people out with folders. So I'm going to save this view as by status. Type. So I'm just going to create a new view. We'll make it a public view. And then if you go in here and select edit current view. This will actually bring you to ye old fashioned classic view components. And if we go down here, there's a little tiny section called group by. And in the group by, we can define up to two groups. So I can do that and that. So I just defined another group. And then if I click on OK. And now if I take something like say first read, which has a ton, 
but they're all one type, so that's not helpful. How about ideas? There we go. So if you see under ideas, we have 21 documents under the status of idea, and 10 of them are blog posts. Okay, and these are essentially just folders. You know, so if I click on this here, we're now looking at ideas that are blog posts. Boom. Well, they have the appearance of folders, but they're right. not folders, yeah. Exactly. That's correct. They have the appearance of folders, but they are not folders. But and this is this is one of those things that I like to use to get people to transition. This helps the adoption. Yep. Um, yes. Because the other thing that you can do that you absolutely can't do with a folder structure is you can now go the other way. So what if I wanted to save this view as, but then flip it around and say, what if I want it by type, and then by status? And do that. So now I just got to go edit my view and make that true. I wish it would auto expand any of the fields that you've already populated. That would yeah. be really nice, but it doesn't. Now you can also turn on and off folder views. Um, yeah, I'm going to get to that. Cool. I was going to do it one at a time. Uh, what was this one now? I've lost track of what I'm doing. Uh, media type. Status. Oh, and then status. Right. Thank you. Copy status. Uh oh, I have two copy statuses in here. That can't be good. All right, so now you see that we have things that are grouped by the status, by the type. Yeah, that was the wrong copy status. So I'm not sure why that's happening, but something got duplicated. So let me go edit this real quick. See, this is the joy of demos, right? We learn so much more. Let's do the other copy status. Boom. And now we have blog posts and then ideas. Now, this is an awesome thing for you guys to demo to the teams when you're trying to convince them of why metadata is better than folders. You absolutely cannot do this in a linear folder infrastructure. You have to choose one or the other. You can't have both. That's the killer feature that, that sold yeah. a lot of people for me. Yeah. And and in addition to this, here's the other thing, right? Like these are these aren't necessarily useful names. What I tend to like to do with this is I like to name the views based on the role that is being done at the time. So you can also apply filters to these views and things like that. Like, like for example, if I look at my by series, it's automatically, you'll notice there isn't there isn't an entry here that says undefined because I put a filter in here that says only show me the ones that are actually a member of a series. So it's already a shorter list. Mike, speaking of filters, click on the funnel. Yep. Click on the funnel. So here's our filters. Was there anything else? Oh, no, no, no. I just well, wanted to will, show that. No, no, no. With the filters, well, it, it would make more sense if you actually selected the filters at the <laughs> before you actually filtered um, your share, um, SharePoint list. No, it's actually a library. Sorry. Your SharePoint library um, than b before because it would have exposed more metadata because right now it's only basic. Right on your results set. Yes. So yes. rather than just so if I go to my recent way. view 
and then click on filters. Exactly. And then that's another way to actually do it as well. Sure. Yeah. But here's the difference, right? This is what I like about this is we can make this even easier for the end users by just predefining a bunch of these. But yeah, one of the ways to think about this, I, I, I also describe these frequently to my clients as a view is just a preset for search. You know, it's just a search preset, right? So when I click on buy series, it's just showing me the documents that are in a series like words matter and the what is, which are not much of a series since we only have one of each. But, you know, as you can tell by our list in the status of to be reviewed, <laughs> we're, we're a bit behind on our blog posts. Um, so yeah, so the other thing that we can do, I want to jump to a whole different world and show you what we can do over here. All right, let's go to library side by side. So here, I want to talk about uh, document sets. So a document set is basically a folder on steroids, OK? So if we go, if we go in here, right, and we look at That's not right. It didn't save one of my views. <sighs> one second, doc set columns. So this one is my doc set columns. And then if I go back to this, then our traditional view doesn't have any of this stuff. And it has this, 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 and this. Boom, that's our standard view. OK. So a document set is a folder that you can apply content to or metadata to. So if I look at this folder in the info pane, we can see metadata that can then be applied to any document that lives inside this folder. OK, so if I go in here, is there any documents in there? There is not. All right, so there's nothing in there, but I believe I put one in Dimitri's. So if we look at the Customer intro for Dimitri. It says Bill Jones, dev guy for WSC of the thing. That one did not work. All right, so let's check this out. So same sort of scenario, right? We've got a back end library called templates. All right, and in this back end library, we can have a Word document that say a customer intro, 
and then we can have email signatures. Right, so we have our email signatures. We can see here we've got Tony Stark as the CEO and we're populating in his phone number and stuff like that. All right, and this is a great way to distribute, you know, universal branding across your company, right? Maybe there's a couple of different signatures that you guys want people to use. You can outline your guidance around how it's utilized, whatever. Um, so that's maybe one example. Um, there can be another example of, say, uh, a customer intro that has a completely different layout, but as you can see, has the same metadata applied to it. Okay. Now, here's what's really fun about this, right? If I select one of these documents, Okay. And if I try to change Tony's name to say Fred, did you guys see what it just did there? I typed in Fred, I hit the enter key, it said saving, and then it said, oh no, you won't either, and it reverted it back to Tony Stark. The reason it did that is because if we go up and we look at dev one, we set up dev one to be pushing out metadata for full name, email, state, and mobile phone number. Oh, that's why the WSC thing is in there. It's static. <laughs> I don't have an attribute for that. <laughs> So it's going to say WSC on all of them. OK, so what's interesting about this is by using document sets, we can actually create stages of things or we can create different components for different sorts of people. So for example, up here, I may have, say, some sort of a the life cycle of a, a document that goes from dev to test to publishing. You know, um, I don't know why I had software on the brain apparently when I when I wrote this, but um, you know, it'd be like you know draft and approval and then publishing something like that. But you can have the statuses be set by the document set. And then literally the people can just move the documents from one place to another. And it'll update the content. Does that make sense? How are we doing in the chat? Drag and drop with two levels. Yes, drag and drop does work on the grouped views. If you drag and drop uh, documents when you're using grouped views, it will also update the metadata. Um, so this is another excellent way. And the, the reason that this came up, I had a client ask me, um, they have a whole bunch of salespeople, you know, um, and when they do their sales collateral, they, they want to customize their sales collateral with the information for each individual user. 
Um, think of this as, you know, this is mail merge brought into the SharePoint era. You know, because what we can do is we can have a series of documents here. You know, we can have multiple documents. Highlight those and then just say copy to. Go over to our marketing team and say, let's look at our collateral document sets and let's put those in the mic folder. Doesn't have any subfolders. Let's copy that there. There's a file that already exists with that. Sure, replace it. Sure, replace it. Two things copy to Mike. Let's click on that so we can see what's what. And now, if we go here and open this, now the same exact document that was just copied into this says, my name is Mike Dixon, senior consultant for WSC of Mass. Got my email address, my phone number. I should have updated that phone number, but whatever. My cell phone's already all over the internet, so it doesn't matter. So in this case, you're using a different folder within the document library to make this work. That's correct. It's a specific type of folder. It's called a document set. OK, and a document set is something that needs to be enabled. At the site level. So you need to go into your. Uh, site information and then we go to view all site settings. And then if we look at our. I think it's just the site features. Nope. It's the collection features. I always get that backwards. I always end up going into both of them. It's in one of them. There we go. So under your site collection features, you need to enable document sets. So you just go over here. It'll say activate instead of deactivate. You just click on that button. Let it, let it think for a few minutes. It shouldn't take a few minutes, just a few seconds. And then that'll light up and say active. And then you'll have the ability to add a document set as a content type. So you can go into the library and say, add and you'll see here there's already one in there for the collateral but you know you could add a regular document set as well great that's that's wonderful thank you very much yeah and again these things all tie together so what i would recommend is you create a content type for the document set that's what I did here. I created a document set, a content type called demo collateral set. So you started with a document set and then modified the content type or like, was there a parent child relationship or? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's a regular, it's just like any other content type. So if we go back to the uh, to the settings, and if we look at our content types, somewhere, there it is. Sorry, I'm losing my mind. There we go. So under content types, we have 
So this is where I defined the actual type itself, or the document set, rather. Um, let me back up and I'll show you. I'll just create a new one. OK, so if I want to create a new doc set. Demo two doc set. OK, I give it a super useful description. I'm going to select where its parent is. So one of the things that you can do is you can inherit content types from other content types. This is another really, really super useful thing to do with your content types. Um, that way you can create a hierarchy so you can have multiple content types that maybe have all of the same shared columns, but you just want to assign different templates to them. Or maybe there's one subset that needs like two or three extra columns or something like that. Then you can set that up so that it's already done. Okay, so I'm going to go with this local one because everything else is from the content type hub. Okay. So now what happened there is because I pointed it to my existing document set, it inherited all of the columns that were already in there. OK, and then you'll see that it inherited the description field was from. Was inherited directly from the base content set or document set that Microsoft creates. So from here, I can actually add another column. Uh, somebody call out a column that I, I should add to this. Color. Color. Color? Sure. I've got color, I think. I don't have color. We call out something else, something that maybe exists. City. City. City's a good one. All right, so I can add city. Boom. So now, so now I have this new, now I've created my new content type. So now if I go down to my collateral templates, now, if I go over here and I click on new, I only have the original. OK, so I still have to add that to this document library. And I'm not going to do that under the view menu. <laughs> we go to library settings, not the view settings. And then here. We can. Add from existing content types. By the way, you always want to do this at the very least at the site collection level, never at the library level. Never, ever, ever. OK, and then if we look here, it's the only one that's available. So we just add it. And now what you'll see if we look down here. It actually added to the column section city. And you'll see what it's used in. It's only used. So the city column is only used in the demo two document set, whereas all of these other columns are used in documents and the demo collateral set and demo two document set. OK, so if you look at this column, this kind of tells you where things are coming from. So this shows you kind of it's a good way to kind of back check and be like, 
where's this column coming from? Like, so for example, I need to go into that, into my bloginator and figure out why I have two status columns. There's something hairy in there. So if I look at this section, that's how I'll be able to troubleshoot that. Okay. So now if I go in here and I hit this drop down, I now have my demo two document set. So I can add one of those. And when I add a document set, this is where this varies from a folder. When you first add your document set, it wants you to fill out all of your information. So as you can see, like I said, I've got all of this stuff from the previous document set because we inherited from that, but we also have city. So we're going to go with Waltham. And we're going to say Russell made me do it. Guy at internet. Um, and we're going to put you in Alaska, Russell. Give you a, a great Hollywood phone number of that. And uh, group. that'd be a cool job title. Oh, man. If I could get paid to do that, I just bounce around from user group to user group. Be awesome. So now if I take one of these documents, right? Like if I go into this dev one thing and I take one of these email signatures, I'm going to take this and I'm going to select move to. And yeah, you guys are right. You can drag and drop all of this stuff. There's a ton of different ways to do it. Uh, where are we? We're in templates. So I'm just going to move it there. And boom. So now by moving it there, I highlight this, and it now has Russell, state of Alaska, guy on internet as email address. So all of that information was automatically applied and is enforced. I cannot change this metadata. If I only have access to this at the file level, I can't change it. And then if you use the document properties in that document, it will replace those document properties with those values from that document set. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Is there an authoritative, and I'm, I'm old enough to use this word, is there an authoritative book on any of this stuff? About spe specifically about content types and document sets. Do you, you, where would you find look for resources on that? Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <Orientated>? <laughs> you know, I, I always describe content types as the hardest part of SharePoint to wrap your head around. Yeah, exactly. And I think document sets are number two. Yeah, I mean, Me and yet too. they're they're both awesome. Um. Yeah, there, they are. There's, there's tons and tons of resources out there. Um, unfortunately, there aren't any that I would trust well enough to refer to as authoritative. Okay. <laughs> um, All right. So um, continue the uh, continue the autodidact learning on your own and experimenting yeah. <laughs> process. Well, I yeah, think you know, a lot I'm a big big fan of testing it. Yeah. You know, and the great thing about content types 
is, um, you know, and this is why I was saying you always want to build at the topmost level, right? So you want to build at the topmost level because that way it's available for you to just create a second library and say, hey, pull this document set in here and let me just run some tests. You know, and you can even create a a test document set content type that inherits from the current one to use as your test piece. And then you can kind of add and remove columns from that, and thereby you're always inheriting whatever the production one is. And you have this little test one. And then once you figure all that out, you can just add those columns to the top level and then production gets it. Perfect. Thank you. Hey Mike, just a, a quick time check. Yeah. Fair point. All right. Um, so one more thing I wanted to check on real quick for you guys. Do, 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 do. Wow, that's a lot of tabs open. One of these. Um, OK, yeah, so to Deb's point, by the way, about audience targeting, huh, I'm a huge fan of audience targeting. And I created a little admin menu all for myself to allow me to jump right out to the core components that I want to access frequently. So this here is the content type hub, OK? This is the existence of this and people talking about this was really the impetus for the title of this presentation. People were talking about metadata being dead. Um, as Deb pointed out, Microsoft is pushing this folders thing. Um, and, and to her point, I hate the way that they do the folder, a folder for every channel. I can't stand it. Um, but I do at least like the fact that you can add the storage and do the rest. I wish you could change it so that that would be the only option. So I could add one and then just say make this default. That would be fantastic. Um, or just redirect the whole thing to something. But as of right now, you can't. But I have lodged my complaints. Um, there is a thing called the content type hub. What this does is this synchronizes all of your content types. No, this is not the modern content type hub. I'm going to get to that. This is the classic content type hub. Um, but really, I want to I want to make this really clear. This is the classic view of the content type hub. There's still only one content type hub. The new modern content type hub, um, which I put a link to right up here in my old content type hub, is huh, prompting me for a login. Do, 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 do. And then it still never actually goes directly to it. So. They're now calling it the content type gallery. But if you look, it's the same exact thing. So this is pulling from the same place. This is really just a new view of the same exact content. OK. Um, so the content type content type hub, in my opinion, gets gets a lot of a, a bad rap. It gets a really bad rap out there, to be honest. Um, there's lots and lots of people that scream bloody murder about it all the time. Um, and I think a lot of that can be cleaned up with just a couple of best practices and a really good understanding of what's going on. OK, so this is a central repository for all of your content types. If you create your content type in the content type hub, then that content type will then be published or, or can be published 
and made available to um, every site in the entire tenant. That doesn't mean that it has to be. It just means that when you click on that use use existing in site, it will be available in that list. OK, if it was made here, if you make it in a in another site, like I made a few of those in that marketing site and I was very careful to name the group for that dot dot local. And I called it dot dot local because it's not in the content type hub. And it's thereby not being published out. OK, so I, I wanted to make that very, very clear. Um, so that said, there aren't really any rules or best practices that Microsoft has really set forth about how best to utilize this. They really just kind of give you the tools and say, uh, yeah, uh, good luck. So it's really kind of on you to create your own sort of naming conventions and best practices. So what I just wanted to do is kind of share with you guys some of the best practices uh, or some of the things, <laughs> I, won't, I won't say that, um, but some of the things that I do, okay? So for example, when I'm first creating a content type, I always name my first one baseline and for my baseline content types, they just inherit directly from the Microsoft content type that I want to use as my starting point. OK, so if you look up here, the parent of this one is just document. OK, um, so. One of the one of the best practices that actually Microsoft does actually say one of the few that they do insist on is that they don't recommend that you modify the base content types and you certainly don't want to do that here in the content type hub because if you do that here in the content type hub then that will affect literally every document throughout your entire environment so that would be bad so we don't do that so i created hey mike also um when you make a, a site column for a content type never ever 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 make it required at the site level Oh yeah, no. at the list of library level. Yeah. Well, and now I'm doing tons of power app stuff, so we actually don't actually require anywhere in SharePoint anymore. Now that we're now that yeah. you once you start using power apps and then you just do all of your validation right in power apps because it's so much more powerful. Um, that said, um, Microsoft has actually gotten a lot better at how they handle required fields and specifically required fields that are missing data. It's nowhere it's nowhere near the absolute um, cluster mess that it used to be. Because um, it used to be huge and now they actually just add a little flag and I believe they send. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Required is not mandatory anymore. It's it's weird, but that's that's right on, Christopher. <laughs> um, required is not mandatory. I like that. Um, but anyways, what I do is I always create my first content type. I name it baseline and then I never publish. So I always put the word baseline in there and I never publish the content type for the baseline. So if you click on manage publishing for this content type, you'll see the last successful publish date is blank. Okay, this means that it's never been published. This page right here, by the way, is I think one of the biggest things that people misunderstand about the content type hub. And I don't blame them, this is badly designed. If you want to publish, a document here, you literally come in here and then just click OK. You don't make any change. 
but literally by coming in here because the because they chose to use radio buttons on this page and publish is selected by default if you come in here and click on okay then it um then it won't uh then it will publish if you come in here and you click on cancel it will not many of us have been trained for years and years and had it beaten into us that if we're not making a change, always hit the cancel button. So we just instinctively hit the cancel button. And a lot of people will say, hey, I made changes to a content type and it's still not available. You know, it's been days, it's still not available. And I swear to you, like 98% of the time when I when I look into it, it's because it was never published. You know, they just they they missed this step. And frequently they'll say, no, I went in there, it was set to publish, right? But it has to have a date, you know? And I'll give you an example of that. If we go to, oh, and, and it also kicks you out when you do that, which is why I have all these quick links over here because I live, eat, and breathe this stuff. So I'm in here a lot. So if we looked at things like, say, our LinkedIn article, right? We know that that was published. So if we click on this and manage the publish, you'll see that this was published back in October. OK, so the fact that there's a date here is what indicates whether or not it was actually published. OK, and then from here you can republish it. So if you make changes, you then have to go in here and you have to hit you you hit republish and then OK. But again, you'll notice that republish is already selected. So you're just clicking OK. This is a really unusual user interface. And this is, like I said, 98% of the catch ups of the hang ups with the uh, content type hub is not understanding this interface. Um, so that's that's kind of a huge deal. Uh, and then the other thing that you can do to speed up the synchronizations, and I know that this is controversial, so some people on the line may scream at me, but I swear to God it works, uh, is if you go into site information and then view all site settings, If you go into the site settings of the destination site that you really need that content type in, you go to the search section, go to search and offline availability, and hit re index site. Okay, when you re index the site, it'll say, hey, this may cause a massive load. It's basically trying to scare you into, please don't do this. Um, this will only cause a massive load if you do have a crap ton of documents in this particular library. So that that is a just statement. Um, but uh, I don't know, y use at your own risk, I suppose. But re-indexing the site will actually set a flag for the site that makes it query the content type hub as a part of that re-indexing process. Okay, you don't have to do this, but if you don't have, if you don't do this, it might be up to 48 hours, I think is what Microsoft says, before it actually shows up here. Um, with me doing this, it typically will show up in about an hour. It's still a little slow. Um, it is still a little slow, but after about an hour, it should show up. My general practice is anytime, anytime I think about, hey, I have to do content type work today, I always think about, Make sure I get that done before the end of the day. <laughs> and
and then just sleep on it. OK, that that's how I just try to arrange my work day. If I know that I'm doing content type work, I make sure that the last thing I do at the end of the day is OK, make sure that's done. Hit the publish button and then go to bed. And then the next day it's always there. Um, but sometimes even in the middle of the day, I've had them come across as quickly as 15 minutes. Um, but typically around an hour. Um, now. I will give that with the caveat of I'm typically not working with sites that contain a huge amount of files. So this this re this re indexing warning is generally safe for me to ignore, but this can genuinely be a, a dramatic impact if you have thousands upon thousands of documents in a single site. Um, and by the way, try not to have thousands and thousands of documents in a single site. There's another quick best practice for you. But I know sometimes that's not avoidable. Um, so those are my two really big things about the content type hub. There's been a lot of people saying content type hub is old. It's not being modernized. Um, thereby, it's dead and you shouldn't use it. This is not the case. Um, well, the fact that it's old is definitely true. It is not going anywhere. There's no way it's going to be deprecated. It may be changed. I hope that it is changed. There are definitely some little gotchas that I've already pointed out that I would love to see updated, but the fundamental system itself will not change, will not be deprecated at least, and in the future, it may just have a really cool, shiny interface that is cleaner and easier to use. Um, and then one last tip that I'm going to give you guys before we go. Um, if you notice in my content type hub, where'd it go? Where'd she go? Oh, well, that's why I have the quick links. Um, you can also test out all of your stuff right here. Nobody should have access to your content type hubs except for a few very top level information architects. This should be very, very limited access. OK, so I use this as kind of a sandbox and it's a perfect sandbox for when you're testing out your content types because here, if you so if you just create a library, create your library locally and then add your document sets and your content types into that library, test it out locally. You can use the content type hub itself as a little bit of a sandbox. You know, um, do not load it up with a ton of files or else that whole indexing thing is going to be a nightmare and you're going to exacerbate the slow sync issues, but you can do really quick, lightweight um, tests just to make sure that you have all the right columns. You're able to create the views that you want. The columns are mapping to the things that you want. Any questions about that? All right. Well, that's pretty much it for my presentation, folks. Um, any questions about anything that I've gone over? We have a mission statement. We have a bunch of demos. <laughs> I was going to list out definitions for all this stuff for you guys. I'll fill this out before I publish the slot, the deck, so you guys all have that. But here's my my contact info. If anybody's interested, you know, I, I am available for private lessons. So feel free to reach out. Feel free to, uh, you know, let me know what's going on. The content type probably just did that is at the tenant level. That's correct. Yes. Okay. There is only one content type hub. Oh, yeah, and I didn't mention that either. 
Microsoft conveniently put absolutely no way to get to it anywhere. So you literally have to actually know the name. So the name is site forward slash content type hub. That's why you'll note that I have links to it all over the place. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's give Mike a virtual round of applause. Great job, Mike. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I don't know if anyone's played with this Teams feature yet, but there's actually the applause button you can now hit directly in Teams. That's right. All right. Oh, um, Bill, so you have a question? Oh, no, I was just trying to do the applause. There we go. That was the wrong button. So we just have a, a few minutes of slides and then we have a raffle. And then who wants to stick around after we can you know, have a drink and, and talk about things that's not recorded. So just real quick, we have a number of events coming up in the next several months. Um, so we have um, M365 Philly Virtual 2021. Um, so this is the equivalent of a SharePoint Saturday, but it covers more than just SharePoint. Um, this is a free online event happening in May, so definitely check that out if you're interested. Um, the M365 Collaboration Conference, um, which is uh, previously called as SP Fest, is happening um, in June in Orlando. We also have um, the SharePoint Fest happening in Chicago in July, the North American Collaboration Summit in August, and then there's also a monthly women IT pros call um, that's happening online monthly as well. Um, I'll take a quick second to pause here. Does anyone know of any other events coming up fairly soon or here in the Boston area? Um, yep, Dimitri, on the 27th is SharePoint's 20th birthday. And it's a whole event speaking with uh, folks. To, well, I just posted the link in the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Chrissy. I would also mention um, Microsoft has been doing really, really well with a lot of their community calls, and they're getting super, super granular on these community calls. And the level of people that they're putting in there is just fantastic. I mean, people doing absolute cutting edge stuff. Um, I'll try to uh, I'll try to send out to you guys a a, a list of all of the. Uh, of there, there's a page that has a link to all of the different community calls, but they have stuff like right down to like adaptive cards community call, um, you know, and yeah, so I've done the adaptive cards. I've done the power apps. Uh, SharePoint dev community call was actually earlier today, but I missed it. Um, there, there's tons of them and they're fantastic. So I highly recommend those as an educational source. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, so moving forward, um, we do have other user groups in the area that are uh, very similar to ours, which is our great avenues for information sharing. We have the Rhode Island user group that also meets online, um, hosted by DRCS. We have the Hartford Office 365 user group, hosted by Jared. We have the Granite State SharePoint user group, hosted by Julie and Jim. And of course, there's a few other ones in the area. Um, of course, we're, you know, we're going to publish these slides so you'll have a chance to come back and, and visit these in more detail. So we are still planning, working on securing a speaker for April. Um, the date will be April 15th at 6 p.m. And as soon as we have more information, we will communicate that out through our website, LinkedIn, Eventbrite, uh, Meetup, as well as our newsletter. So at this point, um, Mike, if you could stop the recording, uh, we'd like to kind of open this up. Um, if anyone's having any problems or, or is having any tips with Office 365, 